Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We meet again and we are talking on a series about the hereafter. We have already spoken so much and we have now reached the major signs before the end of the world. Our deen, Islam, through our messengers whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent and finally Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was Khatam al nabi the seal of the prophets have all informed their people that the world is going to come to an end one day this in Arabic is called or in the Quran is called as sa'a as sa'a means the, the last hour as sa'a means time literally but when we say as sa'a what we mean Islamically is the last hour, meaning the last time, the time when the world will end. And it is called a sa'a because it is unknown. That's why it's called the time or the hour or the last hour. And not literally hour, it just means time, the last time. Because nobody knows when it's going to come. And just to recap on some of the things we said in the past lessons is in the long hadith which came in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, where Jibreel alayhi salam entered one day and in the shape of a man to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi he entered in the shape of a man and he sat in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the most mannerable way that a person can sit in front of their teacher and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said none of us knew this man and he didn't look like he had been traveling and None of us knew him, so it was amazing. What kind of a man was this? He had a very dark black beard and hair. And he was wearing very white clothing. There wasn't a single patch of dirt on it. Where did this man just pop up from? Okay, they didn't have aeroplanes in those days, they didn't have cars. So for someone just pop up like that, no one knows him. And he doesn't look like he's been traveling. And he looks so clean and ready. It was something peculiar to them. Obviously, they didn't know that it was the angel Jibreel alayhi salam until the end of the story. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells him it was the angel Jibreel. Anyway, he sat as a man in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and asked him many questions about Islam, teaching the companions about Islam. He asked him about the five pillars and the pillars of Iman, what, what a Muslim should believe in, the six pillars. And then he asked them about the pillars of something called Ihsan, which is another level of rising closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is to worship Allah as if you can see him. But although you know you cannot see him, you know that he sees you wherever you go. And then he asked him the final question. He said, Mata sa'a? Mata sa'a? When is this sa'a? When is this hour? When is this time? Meaning the end of the world. When is the world, the universe going to be destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And recreated into a different way. When? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied the following words. مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا بِأَعْلَمَ مِنَ السَّائِلِ مَا الْمَسْؤُولُ عَنْهَا The person you are asking. بِأَعْلَمَ Knows more من السَّائِلِ than the questioner. In other words, he said, You're asking me? I don't know any more than you. No one knows when the last hour is. No one can claim to know when the last hour is. No one can say, in the year 2000 and such, the last hour is going to happen. Not even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or even Jibreel alayhi salam, the angel, knew when the last hour is. Allah says in the Quran to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, إِنَّ السَّاعَةَ آتِيَةٌ أَكَادُ أُخْفِيهَا لِتُجْزَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا تَسْعَى So he says, the last hour is going to come. It's very soon, it's going to come. أَكَادُ أُخْفِيهَا I am still hiding it away from everyone's knowledge. No one's meant to know when it's going to be. لِتُجْزَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا تَسْعَى I hid it away from people's eyes and knowledge so that people can be rewarded justly for the work they do. 
So death, we don't know when it's going to happen. And the world's end, we don't know when it's going to happen because otherwise people just leave their good work till the end. They'll murder and cheat and rape and rob and harm and just leave their repentance till the end. But Allah wants us to do our good work justly and wants to reward us with Jannah fairly. Those who really earn it. And there are many other wisdoms. Then Jibreel السلام, asked him, Ma amaratuha? Fama amaratuha? What are its signs then? Are there any signs that tell us it's going to come very close? He said yes. And he gave him two signs among many. When you see that the woman uh, gives birth to its master. There are several meanings to this. One is that when you see mothers giving birth to their children and their children, especially the girls, will grow up to boss their mothers around. Mothers are mentioned here because she's a weaker partner in the family. So she begins to boss her and, 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 t and they take advantage of her. It also means the children in general. It also means that the women who used to be slaves in history earlier, they will become, they will give birth to children who later on in history, later on in the future, these women will become, you know, high in society. Very high and have power and authority in society. Both meanings are correct, but most scholars say that it means mostly that children will become defiant and, if you like, overpowering against their parents. They'll hit them, bash them, defy them, disobey them. They'll overpower them, make them themselves authority over them, throw them in places, you know, become ungrateful to what their parents did. They won't recognize them. And there is a hadith of Prophet ﷺ which backs this up a little bit, where he says the last hour will come when people will start cursing their own dads. This is a sahih hadith. People will curse their own dads. And the companion said, Ya Rasulullah, how can a person curse his own father? He said, well, they will curse, a person will curse another person's father, and so the other person will curse that person's father in, in return. And now that, that didn't usually used to happen in those days. Today you hear about it, even men curse their own, themselves and their own dads all the time, especially you know, where my parents come from in Lebanon. They always say, Il'an abuk. <laughs> May your dad be cursed. This is a common saying. The mother says it to her son. Every time she gets upset with him, <laughs> curse your dad. The father says to his children, <laughs> May your dad be cursed. <laughs> you know what la'na means? That's why the companions they go, La'an? You curse them? The word la'an in Arabic, in Islamic terms here, means that may on the day of judgment, when Allah gives his mercy, may your dad not have any mercy. And may you enter hellfire, and God gives him no mercy at all. He's out with, with, with the shaitans. That's who he's going to be with. Lana is a terrible word. And just a little, just want to mention something here. In Islam, if you curse, say, la'an to an object. In the hadith it says, if you even curse an object, something that doesn't have ruh in it, the la'na will return back to the person who said it. Or if you curse someone, la'an to someone who doesn't deserve the la'an, the curse comes back to the person who said it. If it doesn't find that that person uh, qualifies for this la'na. So you're going to be very careful with that word, among other words, including the word kufr to other, other Muslims saying you're a kafir and so on and so forth. Anyway, the other sign the Prophet ﷺ gave him was, وَتَرَى الْعَالَ رُعَاءَ الشَّاتِ يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ You will see that the shepherds, Bedouin, Bedouin nomad shepherds, in, in, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there used to be these Bedouins who used, didn't really have homes you know, in a stable place. They had tents out in the, in the deserts. And they used to be barefooted. وَتَرَى الْعَالَ رُعَاءَ الشَّاتِ The poor, uh, destitute Bedouin nomads who are barefooted, sheep herders, رُعَاءَ الشَّاتِ, sheep herders, يَتَطَاوَلُونَ فِي الْبُنْيَانِ They will become rich, that they will... It doesn't say rich here, but that's the meaning. That they will build towers very high in the sky. The Bedouins today, our scholars tell us, refer to places like the Emirates and surrounding places. If you look at Dubai, these people in 
you know, a few hundred years back were exactly that, were destitute, nomad Arabs, even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu So their, their offsprings were all, have always been like that. And only in the past few years, they are building the highest, tallest towers in the world. In Dubai, you heard of it? Tallest towers in the world, on islands. This is the hadith of our Prophet Sallallahu which Allah told him about. We've already spoken about the major, some of the major signs. I've spoken about the Mahdi. We've spoken about the Dajjal, Antichrist. We've spoken about the dissension of Isa alayhi salam, Ibn Maryam alayhi salam. And we've also spoken briefly about the rising of the sun from where it sets. That's four. There are 10 major signs that we know of. And during those 10 major signs, the minor signs are still happening. More minor signs are coming up. So don't think that when the minor signs all end, the major signs come. No. It's just that the majority of the minor signs would have ended. And then the major signs begin. But within that time, there's still minor things happening. I forgot to mention just something about the Dajjal last week. A Dajjal, who is the liar, the deceiver, who comes out, is a real human being. I forgot to mention the ways that the Prophet ﷺ advised us to protect ourselves from him. A Dajjal will not be there particularly destroying your homes physically or harming you physically. Although his army would do that, but that's not his... That's not how he gains victory. The way he's victorious in those 40 days that he stays on earth, according to the hadiths of the Prophet wasallam, many hadiths, is through uh, fitan. Fitan are like trials. Fitan that play with your mind, play with your psychology. They play with your psyche. You know, they make you see things that are not there. And they really play with, you, and with poverty. Because what he has the power to stop the rain and stop the earth from growing for you and so on. So you fall into poverty and it becomes a very difficult life for you. It's called a fitna. Either you follow him and live, you know, look after your family and live properly. Or you give up and give up your deen. Or you hold on to your deen and you struggle through those 40 days. For Rasul Sallallahu and all the prophets who warned about the Dajjal, they told us how to protect ourselves from him. So number one, the Prophet Sallallahu advised us, to hold very strongly on our deen Islam. You know what it means to hold on strongly on your deen Islam? Yeah, and you make Islam the most important thing for you in your life. It's more important that you put it in priority to everything else in your life. Everything revolves around it. You take pride in it. In your looks, in your words, where you are, in your environment, the types of friends you choose, the food you eat, the, the clothes you wear. You hold on to it tightly. You hold on to your sunnas tightly, the voluntary things they don't even have to do. You hold on to them. Because these things will make you strong, insha'Allah, when the Dajjal comes out, if it is in our time. To know very well the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very important, brothers and sisters, that we know Asma'ullah al-Husna very, very well. There are 99 names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which He has taught us through the Qur'an all of them in the Qur'an and through his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We must know them well, what their meanings are, what they represent, and apply them according to his names and attributes. If you don't know his names and attributes properly, you don't understand them, learn them. But if you don't understand them by the time Dajjal comes, or even in our time now, the prerequisites of the Dajjal, it's very easy for you to lose your aqidah, very easy for you to lose... Uh, your belief in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll start doing many shirk things. And just to give you a very brief example, very quickly, very quickly, we already have in our time, among the Muslim nations, Muslims who are practicing, the, you know, opposing the names and attributes of Allah, and they don't even know it. I'll give you an example. You know the blue eye? that people wear or they hang up in their houses. Have you ever heard of it? It's a blue eye. We call it an zara in, in Lebanese. Or kharz zara It's a blue eye or a blue um, you know, bead. And sometimes they put it inside of a golden eye or a brass eye and they tell you to wear it. Or you hang it up in your house. You ever seen it? If you don't know what that is, a shoe. What about shoe? 
Some people hang up a shoe in their house, or the horseshoe with an eye in it, or knocking on wood when, uh, when, when, when uh, something beautiful is in front of them, or you praise someone and they knock on wood so you don't envy them or something. All right? So these are practices which oppose the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're believing that by knocking on wood, it prevents harm. So you, you put your trust in something, which, which, in a power which Allah has only in a piece of wood. You're making wood have godly powers. Or um, this eye which people make with their hands. You wear it believing that it prevents harm. That's the same as idolatry. In a time of the Prophet they used to carry their idols around with them to prevent harm from them. There's also pessimism, tiara. You know, if something happens, it means this. You know, um, what do you call it? Seances, if you've ever heard of them, or palm reading, or star signs, astrology. These things, Muslims practice them today and they don't even know it. And because they don't know the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very well. Now imagine when the Dajjal comes and he deceives you with all these other things. You're going to believe in him that he's the God himself. Because the Christians and the Jews among the first of the people of the book are the ones who opposed the correct teachings of the Asma or Sifat, the names and attributes of Allah. And that's why they'll be the first to follow the Dajjal. They don't know what they are. And that's why a large number of Muslims will also follow the Dajjal. Because of their lack of knowledge about Allah's names and attributes. Learn them, my dear brothers and sisters. Learn them well. They are not just names. They have meanings and there is a reason why Allah told us them. Almost after every single ayah in the Quran, almost, Allah mentions a name or two of his. وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْوَدُ وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودُ العزيز الحكيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن الله constantly mentions these names to us to let us know what he is who he is his characteristics سبحانه وتعالى his attributes when you learn them you will know what Allah's attributes are and then you will compare them to the Dajjal's attributes and you will know that the Dajjal is not Allah because Allah says for example that he is self-sufficient he doesn't eat or drink he doesn't need things. A Dajjal eats and drinks. So you'll know that he is not God. Allah al Hayy al Qayyum, he lives forever. Nothing can kill him. When you see Dajjal gets killed, you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a Dajjal. Or he feels pain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees. A Dajjal is awar. He sees with one eye. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Prophet said, Laysa bi awar. Our Lord does not see with one eye, and he's not one eyed like the Dajjal. So you know that a Dajjal comes with this one eye, and Allah is not like that. He's not like that. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing like him, and he hears and knows everything. Number two, In our life now, in your prayers, especially after Al-Ibrahimiyyah, when you're praying four rak'ah prayers, or three rak'ah, or two rak'ah, and you pray, and at the end you recite Al-Ibrahimiyyah. The Prophet used to always, or most often, seek refuge in Allah from the fitna of the Dajjal. In Bukhari and Muslim, for example, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha Radhanu says that the Prophet ﷺ used to say the following words in his prayer: "Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adab al-qabr, wa a'udhu bika min fitna al-masih al-dajjal, wa a'udhu bika min fitna al-mahya wa fitna al-mamat." So he used to say, "Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the tor torment, tor torture, punishment of the grave, and from the fitna, the trial of the Antichrist Dajjal." and from the trials of the day and the night. And many other hadiths like that. So constantly seek refuge in Allah from the Dajjal. Another way to protect yourself is to memorize the first 10 ayat of Surah Al-Kahf or the last 10 ayat of Surah Al-Kahf. This is in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where in Sahih Muslim, for example, the Prophet says, Man adrakahu minkum, meaning the Dajjal, whoever the Dajjal comes in their time, then let them recite the openings of Surah Al Kahf when the, if the Dajjal comes in your time. He also said, Man hafidha ashra ayatim min awwali Surah Al Kahf, usima min al Dajjal. Whoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al Kahf, he or she will be protected from the Dajjal. Meaning, from his trial. Meaning you won't fall prey, you won't follow him. You won't follow him, you won't believe in him. You'll disbelieve in him. 
And that's because not only memorizing them, but you should understand their meaning. The meanings in, in, in the 10 ayat of the first of Kaf or the last one, have ino- they're just, they're, they've got so much wisdom in them. I want you to read it and analyze the meanings that are in there. So these are some of the ways that you can protect yourself from the Dajjal. And lastly, run away from the Dajjal. Go to the places like Mecca and Medina, because you will not be able to enter them. The next major sign that I want to talk about is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. But before I say it, the Prophet ﷺ tells us also in Muslim that any one of these signs, if they appear, there is no more repentance. There is no more repentance. You can't make tawbah anymore. The rising of the sun from where it sets. The Dajjal when he arrives and Isa ibn Maryam when he descends. And also, there is another hadith about the fourth one, Adab. There is a beast that comes out of the earth. We're going to talk about soon. No more repentance is accepted when this time comes. So if a person follows the Dajjal, they can no longer return back to Islam. For example. So, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Strange wordings. There are actually two words. Ya'juj is one and Ma'juj is another. And, in, and when you say it in Arabic, for an Arab who listens to that word, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, it's a very harsh and you know, coarse word. It comes from the root word of, of, of uh, Ujaj, to be dry, to be dry and to be harsh. And it also comes from the meaning al Aj, meaning when the enemy comes really fast, close to you really fast, comes, attacks you really quickly. So these Ya'juj and Ma'juj, they are dry and harsh in nature. And when they come out, they're going to come out so quickly and so fast that you will not be able to stand in front of them. You have to run away from them. That's what the scholars tell us about these meanings. And Ya'juj is a tribe. And Ya'juj is another tribe. But they are related. And they are actual human beings. Ya'juj and Ma'juj are human beings. They are tribes that actually exist on earth. They existed close to the time of Musa alayhi salam. In an era of a great, great king named Dhul Qarnayn. Anyone heard of Dhul Qarnayn? Dhul Qarnayn, the man of the two horns. He was called that name because he used to wear a, a hat that had two horns coming out of it. That's one meaning. Another meaning, they think why he was called Dhul Qarnayn, the man of the two horns, means the man of the two, the man of the two eras or generations or the, or the king of the generations. Because Qarn means horn and also means in Arabic generations or eras. The point is that Dhul Qarnayn was an extremely powerful king. And he was a worshipper of Allah, a righteous, just Muslim king, among the best that ever existed on earth. And he had so much power, so much authority, that his kingdom reached almost the whole world. Yani, why do I say almost? Because there were parts of the world where civilization hadn't reached yet, as today. But whatever existed in that time, wherever civilization reached, Dhul Qarnayn had power to there, right to the end part of civilization. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Dhul Qarnayn in Surah Al-Kahf. You'll find Surah Al-Kahf mentioning so much, that's why it's so important in relation to Ad-Dajjal. It speaks about Dhul Qarnayn as being that king. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him, as I said, as a just and fair leader who used to say, whoever does good, then we will reward him. And whoever does wrong, then we will punish him, a punishment in this earth, and in the hereafter will be punished by his Lord, a punishment that is unheard of. So he was very strict on laws, that, laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down. And he was very rewarding and generous for those who do good. So everybody loved him. And he brought justice this way. Very harsh on the wrong, and very generous on the good. And Allah tells us about Dhul Qarnayn describing his amount of kingdom, saying that, you know, in a very allegorical 
beautiful way of language in the Quran saying that Dhul Qarnayn he reached he reached a very far distance in land he used to go around the whole world to see who is being oppressed who is doing good to reward them bringing justice between people he used to physically go out with his army like that looking everywhere as far as he can that's what he spent his life in traveling the world and applying justice and worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everywhere he went so Allah describes one of his journeys one of his journeys by saying that he went one time to establish justice and when he reached Allah says in the Quran when he reached the place of the setting of the sun he found it setting in a murky pond or in a murky water what does this mean? it means now there are non-Muslims out there who try to use this against us they say what's this Quran talking about science how can a sun set inside of water when we know that the earth rotates around the sun and how can a man reach the setting of the sun the sun doesn't set the earth rotates around you can't really reach the sun there's no such thing what these miserable people don't understand is the language of the Quran okay they can't come and teach us about the Quran now the Arabs at the time of the Prophet ﷺ understood it better than these miserable people. And if there was any problem with it, they would have beaten them to find a fault in the Quran. Trust you me. So these people come and use half suck twisty English and they try to uh, you know, explain the Quran through their miserable ways. The Quran here is talking allegorically because the Quran addresses human beings. And when you address human beings and especially the whole world, it has to address them in a way where everybody could understand simple language. Allah is saying allegorically in a beautiful speech that in two things he reached a place where it looks like the sun is setting it looks like that it's like saying oh the sun set behind the mountain behind the hill if you go behind the hill will you find the sun no we say it's set behind the sun behind the mountain everybody uses that language or you say oh look at that rainbow it starts from there and ends there but it doesn't really end there it doesn't even come on earth so it's what the eye sees. Allah says, when he reached where it seemed like the sun was setting. In other words, Allah is telling us, Idul Qarnayn reached a very, very far end of the world. He said he found it setting in a murky pond, meaning it looked like as if it was setting inside the ocean. And it looked murky to him. Because when the sun is setting, you could see a very strange appearance on the surface of the ocean. Allah called it Hami'ah, murky or a strange appearance or a, a foggy appearance. He found the sun setting there, meaning there was no more land beyond where he reached. Meaning Dhul Qarnayn reached the farthest land where nobody could reach even further. There was no more civilization after there. That's what the verse is talking about. He said he found people there. وَجَدَ مِن دُونِهِمَا قَوْمًا لَا يَكَادُونَ يَفْقَهُونَ قَوْلًا He found there people that could hardly understand normal speech. Very primitive in speech. They said, Ya Dhul Qarnayn, O Dhul Qarnayn, they knew he was the king. Can you please help us? Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Mufsiduna fil ard, they are corruptors on earth. Now I want you to analyze with me over here. These people who are complaining to Dhul Qarnayn, they were very primitive in lifestyle and in language. So he reached the border of the world where civilization was so behind. And they were trying to explain to him about this other civilization that are even worse than them. That are even more primitive, worse and corruptive than these people that he just met. This is what Allah says in the Quran. Allah says, then Dhul Qarnayn took a pathway. When he reached between two dams, there were some kind of dams that blocked between two, blocked a city or a village or a town. These people could hardly understand normal speech, very primitive. They 
So he said, oh, Dhul Qarnayn, Ya'juj and Ma'juj are very corruptive on earth. They kill, they take, they steal, they do all these things. Can we give you some help, bring you some people to help you do what? So that we can help you to make a, a barrier. A barrier between us and them so that they can't come to us and they can be cut off from the world. Then Dhul Qarnayn replies, قَالَ مَا مَكَّنِّي فِيهِ رَبِّي خَيْرٌ فَأَعِينُونِي بِقُوَّةٍ أَجْعَلْ بَيْنَكُمْ وَبَيْنَهُمْ رَدْمًا He said, Allah has already given me enough power. I don't need your help. Thank you for offering. But what I want you to help me with is just a little bit of, may, of starting off the foundations of the wall. I'll make between you and them a wall. آتوني زبر الحديد Bring me some of your زبر الحديد It's a kind of metal like brass, very strong metal that can withhold any kind of environment, climate change. It doesn't rust very quickly. It doesn't, or it doesn't rust at all and it doesn't break. Zubar al-Hadid. So it's the metal that cannot get rusted. So he, he, he built it in such a way, he said, that he ordered for them to blow heat. So he melted it. And he melted it and molded it in such a way that it became so solidified, so strong through heat and through steel that he said, Hatta ida jalahu nara, he made it melting because of fire. He said, Atuni ufrig alayhi qitra, bring me this other type of material that I may add to it, qitra, that will make it extra strong. So the whole idea here, Allah is telling us that he built a wall or a barrier or a dam, something that was so strong, so impermeable, that nothing can reach and nothing can come, nothing can break it down anymore. No climate, no people, no weaponry, nothing. Allah says in the Qur'an, فَمَا اسْطَاعُوا أَن يَظْهَرُوهُ وَمَا اسْتَطَاعُوا لَهُ نَقْبَا He said, no one was able to break through it and no one was able to overpower it. It was such a strong wall, impermeable to anything. And when Dhul Qarnayn looked at the people, they looked at this wall and they said, wow, this is a very strong wall. And Dhul Qarnayn wanted to teach them a lesson finally. He said, Qala hadha rahmatun min Rabbi. He said, this is from the mercy of my Lord. What's the mercy here? That he allowed us to prevent you from the corruption of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Then he said, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي جَعَلَهُ دَكَّاءَ وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّي حَقَّا He said, now, this, is, this wall has been built there, it's strong. This is a mercy from your Lord for now. But, when the promise of my Lord has arrived, Allah has decreed something that's going to happen. Allah will make this wall destroyed he will destroy it dakka meaning it will be level with the ground the promise of my lord is truly going to come no doubt what is he saying here he's saying that the ajuj and Maju will be blocked off the world from the world until a certain time that is going to come allah it is only allah who will destroy who will allow for this wall to be destroyed and when it is destroyed this ajuj and Maju will come out Allah says, وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي بَعْضٍ وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّونِ فَجَمَعْنَاهُمْ جَمْعًا He said, and so we left them. يَأْجُوجٌ مَأْجُوج We left them. And we left the people like this in this way. يَأْجُوجٌ مَأْجُوج Away from the people. And they living among one another. Allah says, but we will surely bring everyone, including يَأْجُوجٌ مَأْجُوج Everyone back when the trumpet is blown. So no one has been able to break through this wall ever since. And Allahu A'lam, if anybody has ever reached that place, but if you want to know where it is from the tafsir that I've read, and Allah knows best of course, they indicate that their, situ their position is somewhere near the upper part of the world, towards the North Pole. 
So towards the Russian areas, Russian areas in that, in that, in that sort of region, higher up towards the North Pole area. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best exactly where they are. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Sahihain in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam woke up one afternoon very frightened or very concerned, sorry. Fazi'an. Like he was, he was concerned, shocked. And he said, La ilaha illallah. Out of shock. Wailun lil Arab min sharrin qad iqtarab. Woe to the Arabs from a bad thing that has come very near. Futiha liyawma min radmi ya'juji wa ma'juja mithlu hadi. Today, the wall of Ya'juj and Majuz has been opened as much as this. And he made a ring with his fingers. He said, this much has been passed through the wall of Ya'juj and Majuj. Then Zainab, radiallahu anha, said, Ya Rasulallah, afanahliku wa fina salihun. He said, will we be destroyed? And among us there are still righteous people? Yani, when he said Ya'juj and Majuj, it's basically saying that the, the end of the world has come very near. Allah is going to destroy the world. So Zainab says, Ya Rasulullah, are we going to be destroyed so soon? And still among us there are righteous people. There's you, there's the Sahabas, there's all these righteous people whom Allah praised in the Quran. Qala na'am. He said, actually, yes, you can be destroyed while righteous people are among you. Ida kathura. He said, Ida kathura al khabath. He said, is the righteous people will be destroyed among the non righteous people if, on one condition, when indecency and immorality spread too much. It's too much of it. Allah will destroy the people, including the righteous people among them. There are two definitions to this or interpretations. Number one, either because the righteous people are not doing their job or the corruption has exceeded so much that the righteous people cannot do any more. So it's time to take them away. The test of the world is, is, is pointless. Take them, start judging them, put whoever's in heaven and whoever goes to hell, hellfire. Pointless now to live on. So beware, my dear brothers and sisters, and continue in your da'wah. Now, what does this mean? Does that mean that Yajuj and Majuj has, have, have already pecked through the wall since that time? Allahu A'lam. What it means, though, is that it is close. How are they breaking through? Allahu A'lam. How much of it is actually now open? Allahu A'lam. But the point is, when it's finally opened... And yet, Juj and Majuj are able to come out. It'll be the time when Allah has decreed and they will come out. And this is the way it will happen when the day comes. First of all, the Juj and Majuj are unable to get out of there. Number one, there are many reasons why. Number one, as we said before, they are a very primitive people. Their understanding of technology is not like ours. They don't know what's going on in the world right now. They don't, they don't have computers, they don't have airplanes, they don't have these weaponry we have. They have nothing. Remember the people who say, who said to, to Madhul Qarnayn, please protect us from them. And they were primitive themselves. Well, Yajuj and Majuj are even more primitive than them. So they don't have the idea of technology of how to you know, break through this wall. Nor, and they are between mountains. These mountains are covered with so, such bad climate that if they try to go up these mountains, they'll die. So they can't go around or on top of this wall. Some people said this wall is the Great Wall of China. No, it's not the Great Wall of China. For the Great Wall of China is broken. You can easily pass through it and on top of it, it's a tourist um, you know, site. Yajuj and Majuj are not behind the wall of China, nor are they the Chinese people. A lot of people they say, oh they're the Chinese people. And some people they describe them as being short, you know, they're, they're, like, they're like really, they're like midgets walking around oh, and they've got these strange eyes and about if, uh, this is all rubbish, you know, there's nothing in the hadith that states that they are like that. Like aliens or something. They are real human beings from the upper part of the world they have a certain look, maybe, maybe more of an Asian look because it's that region or more, you know, more, of, more of that type of a look, Allahu A'lam. But the point is they are people, they are humans like you and us, but they are just very, very corruptive. They are more corruptive than the corruptive people of today. Immoral. Uh, no principles, nothing. And when they come out, they just destroy. They destroy, rob, rape, kill, murder, all of these things. And they just worry about, they, just, they, they want to be the leaders of the world. They want to be the power, but in a very, you know, 
They're like gangsters, but the worst of gangsters, like thugs, the worst of thugs ever, ever seen, ever known. The Prophet sallallahu tells us, إذا أوحى الله إلى عيسى أني قد أخرجت عبادا لي لا يدان لأحد بقتالهم فحرز عبادي إلى الطور. These Ajuj and Ajuj will come out in a time where Isa alayhi salam has already descended. Isa alayhi salam will be among us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send Jibreel alayhi salam to Isa to tell him alayhi salam that a certain type of servants of mine, meaning creations of mine, have now been released. Allah is talking about Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So take my servants, meaning take the Muslims, O Isa alayhi salam, take them to the mountains, At-Tur. Tawtur means here mountain. And hide. You will not be able to beat them. They are too many. They are so many, my dear brothers and sisters, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, that the Prophet ﷺ once, I want you to listen to this, he sat down with his companions and said, for every one person that enters paradise, 999 will enter hellfire. Ah, that's, that's frightening. It means like, do we have any chance for every one person, 999 enters hellfire? So the Sahabas were concerned and they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, Ithan, therefore none of us will enter paradise, baby. Who's going to enter it? He said, don't worry. From your nation, meaning from, from my nation, just from the Muslims that ever exist, from the time of Muhammad Sallallahu until the end of time, just from the Muslim nation, not from the world, from the Muslim nation, from every one of you, there is 999 of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. I mean, they are 999 folds more than the nation of Muhammad وسلم, that exists. So if we are you know, now, let's say, a billion or just over a billion, how many would that make Ajuj and Ma'juj currently in population? Okay, you need good mathematicians to calculate that. Maybe good accountants here. If you can figure it out, then you've got yourself business here. If they are human like us, have prophets come to them? Of course. We don't know which prophet, but we do know they are close to the time of Musa alayhi salam. He is a messenger. But Allah tells us there isn't a single nation except that a prophet has come to them. So they did get a prophet, but they rebelled. And Akhil Karim, if you look in all the prophets, there were only two prophets that are mentioned to us whose people accepted him. The rest all rejected him, and they were destroyed, or some of them were left. And Yajuj and Majuj are offsprings, obviously, of nations. <coughs> Uh, Ajam, they're non-Arab. We're not, they don't specify what they are, but they're non-Arab nations who betrayed their, their prophets in the past. So they are a large amount. Let's listen to the remainder of the hadith. The hadith says, وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ This is an ayah in the Quran, by the way. Allah says, حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ They're actually mentioned in the Quran. Behold, the day when Ya'juj and Ma'juj are released. وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ The word hadab, he says, they will be from every hadab, crawling, walking. They'll be there. What does hadab mean? Hadab means every, every place on earth, whether low or high, they will reach it. And they will be there. And what this really means is that they will come out from a very rough and rigid place. It doesn't mean that they will enter every single area of the world, even though the meaning seems that way. But what it means is that when they come out, they'll, you will see them coming out from places that have high and low cliffs. So they'll come out from a very rugged area. Where they are right now, it's cliffs and hills and mountains and valleys. So Allah is telling us they will initially come out from valleys and mountains and rough terrain and they'll come out and disperse in the world. They don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will go to every part of the world. But what it means is that they'll come out from those rigid and ragged terrains. Hadab means ragged and rigid terrains. And he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
فيمر أولئك على بحيرة طبرية. They will pass by the ocean or the sea of Tabariya. Do you know where Tabariya is? بحيرة طبرية. Anyone know where, know where that is? Yes. It is close to Asham, to Syria, and where Jordan is in Syria, in that area. They will come past Buhayra Tabariya. And what happens there? Buhayra means a small sea. So it's bigger than a lake, smaller than a sea. Huge area, probably a few kilometers in, in, in diameter and circumference. They will drink every bit of water that's in it. وَيَمُرُّ آخِرُهُمْ Now they're coming, you know, like group after group, yeah, because there's a large amount of them. So the first amount of them will drink it all. And then either in the same day or a few days later, the other group is still coming. And they'll come to the same Buhaira, this little sea, and they won't find any water in it. <laughs> it's, they drank it all. لَقَدْ كَانَ بِهَذِهِ مَرَّةً مَا They will say... We think that there was once upon a time water here. Okay, this indicates that they are phenomenally large population. وَيُحْصَرُ نَبِيُّ اللَّهِ عِيسَى وَأَصْحَابُهُ وَأَصْحَابَهُ حَتَّى يَكُونُ رَأْسَ الثَّوْرِ لِأَحَدِهِمْ خَيْرًا مِنْ مِئَةِ دِنَارٍ لِأَحَدِكُمُ الْيَوْمِ He said, Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet of Allah and his companions, if we are there and we follow him, we ask Allah to make us among them. If we are there, we'll be his companions. Isa and his companions will be imprisoned. Imprisoned meaning they'll be restricted to the mountains. And we will have no, we will have no, no way to get to food. So the Prophet ﷺ said to the point where he said a buffalo... A buffalo would be more valuable than a hundred dinars of your time. Prophet is speaking to his companions. A hundred dinars in those days was يعني, a huge amount of money. It's like saying something like a hundred thousand dollars of our time. It's like that, something like that. He said, a buffalo would be more valuable than, than a hundred thousand dollars in other words. Just figuratively speaking here. So what it means is that they will be in, in so much need of food. فَيَرْغَبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ عِيسَى وَأَصْحَابَهِ Then Isa a.s. and his companions will start supplicating to Allah, make dua to Allah because they'll be in such a hard time. فَيَرْسِلُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمُ النَّغَفِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to the dua of Isa a.s. and his companions and he will send a disease, a worm. Naghaf is a worm, type of worm or a type of parasite that will come out of the necks of the ajuj and ma'juj as a disease, it'll, it'll be in their necks. That's where it'll, the disease will be situated. And then they will all look like as if they have been killed all at once. Like you're in a battle and they'll be killed all at once. They'll all die wherever they are on earth. As if one body has died, they all die at once. ثُمَّ يُهْبَطُ بِنَبِيِّ اللَّهِ عِيسَى وَأَصْحَابُهُ وَأَصْحَابَهُ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ Then Isa alayhi salam and his companions will be told to come down. How will they be told? Isa alayhi salam will send a man. He'll say, who of you will volunteer to go down and check if your ajujah ajujah are dead or still alive? But if you go down, it means you're sacrificing yourself. If they're alive, they're going to kill you. So one man will go down and find that they're all dead and they will tell Isa alayhi salam and then Isa alayhi salam this will be a cause for him and his companions to descend from the mountains and come back on earth to eat and drink and live. He says, فَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَوْضِعَ شِبْرٍ إِلَّا مَلَأَهُ زَهْمُهُمْ وَنَتَنُهُمْ yeah, They won't find a palm's length, a palm span of, of place on earth except that you will find either their, their carcasses, their dead bodies there and their stench. They'll smell very badly. Then Isa السلام, and his companions will ask Allah again to remove these people from there. So then Allah sends طَيْرًا كَأَعْنَاقِ البخت. He will send birds that have necks like the necks of vultures. فَتَحْمِلُهُمْ It will carry their bodies. And this indicates to us that either their bodies are small in build or that they would have decayed 
you know, decompose to the point where they become light. فَتَطْرَحُهُمْ حَيْثُ شَاءَ اللَّهِ and they throw their bodies places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends rain and it fertilizes the land and their stench is gone. So, Juj and Ma'juj, there's another hadith that says when they come out, they will fight the people of the, anyone in front of them, they'll kill them. So, there will be non Muslims that they'll be hiding. They won't kill everyone. But anyone in front of them, they'll kill them. And they'll only survive for a few days or months. Not days, maybe months on earth. There's no clear indication of this, but we say months because of the hadith that it says that the Muslims will be in such a difficult time. Food will run out, money will run out, so they'll still be here for a little while. And after they kill, they think they killed all the people of earth, they turn their arrows to the sky and they return with blood on them. And they say, we have now killed the people of the sky. Malakna al-ard. We are now, we are now the kings of earth. But then Allah perishes them. This is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. What's the wisdom behind it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but they are one of the major signs that the end of the world has come very, very near. Very near at the time of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The Prophet gives another description. He says, They will come out on earth, they will finish the water, the people will run away from them. They will throw their arrows into the sky. It will come back with blood on them. And they will say, we have killed the people of earth and the sky. And now we are the kings of earth. The Prophet ﷺ tells us that when the Ajuj and Ajuj die, he said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ By Allah. The beasts that eat meat, the beasts of the earth, the carnivores, will be the fattest they have ever been. They'll be the fattest they've ever been. Why? Because they eat from the bodies of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So every single beast on earth will be as fat as it has ever been. That's the amount of people they are of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. After Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Isa alayhi salam lives on earth, well, during his whole lifespan, many hadiths are said about him, but the majority of the hadiths say seven years, some hadiths say 40 years, we don't know which ones are the most authentic, but according to the majority of our scholars, seven years is what they rest on. Their number of years is not entirely important to us, but what's important to us is to know that Allah will send out these major signs, they are not explained in too much detail than what you have already heard. After that, there will be khusufat. Now, this is another major sign. There will be swallowings of earths, swallowings. There will be major continent, well, maybe not continents, but large lands that will actually disappear under the earth. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be gone, either into the water or they'll be destroyed head over heels. There'll only be dirt left. And the Prophet ﷺ tells us in the hadiths, سَيَكُونُ بَعْدِي خَسْفٌ بالمشرق. After me, after Prophet's death, there will be a swallowing of earth in somewhere in the eastern region, eastern to Medina. وَخَصْفٌ بالمغرب, And in the west of Medina, somewhere there. وَخَصْفٌ فِي جَزِيرَةِ العرب, And there will be also a swallowing of the earth in the lands of the Arab, the Arab Peninsula. So Allahu A'lam what will happen in that time. And there will be righteous people also go in those landslides, if you like. There will be righteous people but that's because, listen to what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said, إذا أكثر أهلها الخبث. One companion said, Ya Rasulullah, the earth will swallow the people even if among them there are righteous people. He said, yes, إذا أكثر أهلها الخبث. If its people start to do too much immorality and indecency and all of those things. And we, we, we have that today. You can see a lot in the eastern regions. You can see it a lot in the west. You know, homosexuality and prostitution and all those other khabath. People no longer believe in God and so on and so forth. Then there will be smoke. Smoke will come and it will fill the whole sky. How much time do we have? Five minutes. Barakallahu feek. This is another major sign. Allah said in the Quran, which means wait until the day comes when the sky will be filled of clear smoke. Everybody in the world will see it. Mubin, everywhere. Yaghshan, yaghshan nasa, 
or يغش الناس هذا عذاب أليم. يغش الناس meaning the smoke will cover all the people. يغشهم أجمعين. It will cover all the people of the earth, and people will say, or Allah says, هذا عذاب أليم. This will be a day of torment. Allah A'lam, what kind of a torment or a day that would be, would be? Has it happened? Allah A'lam. Will it still happen? Allah only knows, but the majority of the scholars say it is yet to happen. And this is also one of the signs of the closeness of the last hour. Also among the major signs before the end of the world would be, as we said last week, the rising of the sun from where it sets. The world, the universe, is moving in a very peculiar way now. And some scientists, as I said last time, say that it will reach a plateau phase. It will just stop. And they say either a universe is going to be recreated or there will be something called the big crunch. It's a big bang now. And they say that probably a big crunch, where the universe will crunch itself. So the planets will collide and the stars will collide upon each, upon each other. And the, star and the, the, the stars will collide with each other. Meteors will hit the earth. And when this happens, everything's reversed. So the magnetism of Earth, as you know it today, will be reversed. So things will be flying up in the air. The oceans and the waves will be the imbalances in Earth. The clouds, the rain, the, the, the mountains will be destroyed. So everything will be reversed on Earth. And so the last hour will be occurring. And the first sign you see is when the sun reverses itself. So the Earth is rotating this way and then it will be rotating the other way and the sun will look like it's setting from the other side a reverse situation of the universe's crunch that day no more repentance will be accepted by anybody as we said and finally there will be something called a dab the beast it will come out of the earth Allah knows what it looks like it will speak to the people that you have disobeyed your Lord. And that will be among the final of these major sins, major signs. The only thing after that left is an nafkhu fi sur, the blowing into the trumpet. <laughs>